Thank you very much for that very kind and overly generous introduction, Brian. It's a real pleasure to be here with you from Oxford and having the opportunity to share with you some of the research we're doing on how the tech economy is evolving, how that is reshaping the world of work, and more importantly, lately, how uh, the COVID-19 pandemic is reshaping the way we work um, as well. Now, some of you might remember that we have had this debate surrounding remote work before. In 2005, Thomas Friedman, a famous uh, journalist at the New York Times, published a book called The World is Flat, in which he predicted that the digital revolution would cause the end of the office and the death of cities. Rather than clustering in expensive locations like London and Paris, people will suddenly be able to work from wherever they wanted, taking advantage of the tools that we now have available um, to us. And, and I think it's important to remember that most of the technology that enables remote work has actually been with us for some time. Email came in the 1990s, Skype around, arrived in 2004, and Dropbox came along in 2010. And clearly there have been many improvements on various components of those technologies uh, since then. But the basis have been with us for some time. Yet, I think it's fair to say that many of the predictions of the 1990s and early 2000s about the end of the office has so far not materialized. One of my favorite quotes are uh, probably from Francis Karen Cross, great book, The Death, Death of Distance, in which she suggests that in half a century's time, it may well seem extraordinary that millions of people once trooped from one building, their home to another, the office each morning, only to reverse the procedure each evening. Commuting wastes time and building capacity. One building, the home, often stands empty all day. Another, the office, usually stands empty all night. All of this may strike our grandchildren um, as bizarre. Yet if we look at the data, what has happened since then, has, if anything, been a growing importance of cities and location? If we go back to the 1970s or 1980s, what we do see is that new jobs that were, didn't exist in the decade before and that relate to new technologies actually were fairly dispersed across space. What happened with computerization and the digital revolution was actually that work became more clustered than ever before. Uh, computer technologies and digital technologies, rather than flattening the world, made it more uneven. And the quintessential example of this is obviously places like Silicon Valley and Seattle, which are the for at the forefront of digital technology, yet are some of the most clustered places in the world. In similar fashion, if we look at patterns of remote work across Europe, but also in the United States, we find that it's roughly flat up until the pandemic. All across Europe, around 5% of the workforce uh, reported working some days remotely. And obviously at the peak of the pandemic, to varying degrees, it's reached above 50% uh, of the workforce working from home. So we've really seen a sort of staggering uptake in remote work. It's an experiment that we never seen before. Um, clearly, the potential for working remotely uh, depends very much in which industry you are. And uh, I think it's fair to say that, broadly speaking, if there is one predictor of how likely it is you're going to be able to work remotely, it is the income of that industry, right? So high income industries on average are much more likely to be industries which allow remote work. Financial services is the industry with the highest uh, remote work potential, according to our estimates, with almost 80%. But you can also see that other professional services and um, the technology sector are obviously, are very high up in uh, uh, that ranking. And conversely, if you look at low income industries like leisure and hospitality, very few people are able to work remotely. And so the concern that technology has driven a lot of, in of the income inequality we've seen across societies up until the pandemic has to some extent sort of been amplified 
through this channel of digital technology, allowing relatively skilled occupations to work more remotely. And on the bright side, um, though, I think it's been a great, not just you know, for people in those industries, but also potentially to some extent uh, in driving innovation. And this is sort of a continuation of an existing trend, which paradoxically shows that um, from the 1990s, when people actually predicted the end of the office, up until the, today, the uh, number of kilometers between patentees on the same patent uh, application has been increasing exponentially, which might suggest, after all, that Karen Cross and Friedman were right after all. Uh, but I think it's important to remember that those inventors who are on those patents had to meet somewhere in the first instance in order to be able to collaborate, right? And there's a lot of experimental evidence of this, which suggests that you know when important conferences get cancelled, for example, and people within those domains don't collide in a given year, innovation does suffer as a consequence. None of us live in cyberspace. Our uh, digital networks very much mirror our networks in the physical world, and. You know, what I think is very helpful in terms of understanding the way the labor market is likely to evolve in the future is through the lens of the project or product life cycle. So for me as an academic, for example, when I want to start up a new project, I like to, you know, uh, go out for lunches, for dinners, for drinks, to explore and get new ideas and to get uh, inspired. Um, and that is, I suspect, the reason why knowledge industries have always clustered, you know, from the days of Renaissance Florence up until today. But when it is um, that I have decided on what I actually want to do, what it is I want to execute upon, I prefer working from home, where I'm left in peace, where I can execute in, you know, quite uh, productive um, ways, I hope. And um, so at that point in time, I want the very opposite of what I want at the beginning of the project, which is I want to be left alone. And I think that most projects actually function on that. We have an early stage of exploration for which offices and cities are going to continue to be very important and probably become more important in the future. But we also have an execution phase where things that can be done remotely and when things are more standardized and things can potentially also be offshored and automated away. And I think one of the key challenges for advanced economies going forward is that many of these sort of production tasks, not just in manufacturing, but also in services, are increasingly likely to be offshore. And, and if you look at a map on to which, which locations these offshoring has happened in the past, it has generally been to English speaking countries. So places like in the uh, United States and Britain offshoring to low income English speaking countries like India, Bangladesh and Pakistan. But with recent advances in artificial intelligence and in machine translation in particular, I think it is going to be feasible for more countries to actually develop that way through um, uh, by taking advantage of the growing offshoring uh, of services. Secondly, when things are standardized and routinized, they are not just becoming more offshoreable, but also increasingly automatable. And one thing that has happened in recent years and that has arguably been accelerated by the COVID-19 uh, pandemic is that with the recent advances in machine learning and artificial intelligence, the potential scope of automation has increased vastly beyond routine rule-based activities that can easily be specified in computer code and therefore readily automated. And what's very hard to automate still though are tasks that entail complex social interactions and creativity. And I think the state of the art is probably best described here by Turing, to uh, 
Turing test competitions where chatbots try to convince human judges of them being a person. And some people in the field argue that there was a breakthrough uh, some four years ago now, when one chatbot actually managed to, co managed to convince 30% of human judges of it being a person, but it did so by pretending to be a 13-year-old uh, Russian orphan boy speaking English as his second language. Um, and if you think about the variety of much more complex social interactions you do in your and daily jobs where you try to convince people that you write about something, we try to motivate your colleagues, we try to negotiate a new deal. Uh, jobs that are intensive in those type of social and creative um, activities are very far off from being automatable. Uh, conversely, some low skill type of jobs that entail the perception and manipulation of irregular objects, for example, or that requires the ability to navigate complex unstructured environments, like that of a cleaner who has to be able to identify and distinguish between hundreds of different objects in your home and also capable of manipulating those ob objects. Those are occupations that we are very likely to see being automated away in the near future. Uh, but not all occupations are very intensive in those tasks. In fact, in a recent study, we estimate that roughly 47% of jobs in the United States are not very intensive in those type of tasks. And, and that doesn't just entail, you know, production jobs being automated away or, you know, driverless cars taking the jobs of truck drivers. We do actually find some pretty surprising results, but which have reassured us over time. So when we published this study a number of years ago, we found that uh, fashion models are among uh, the job that are most exposed to automation uh, and artificial intelligence going forward. And some people did think that this was rather silly. But since then, we've seen staggering advances in generative adversarial networks, as they're called, which have actually created the fashion models you can see from on these pictures here through thousands of pictures, right? And these, you know, uh, artificial models, they do have their own Instagram accounts and they're already being used in production. Uh, overall, though, I think it's important to remember that it's not the jobs of doctors and lawyers that are going to be automated away, although there are certainly tasks in those jobs that are uh, heavily exposed to automation. Overall, it's low-skill, low-income jobs that are most exposed. And when President Obama's Council of Economic Advisors um, tried to sort our um, automation estimates by uh, levels of income, they found that occupations earning less than $20 per hour have a probability of roughly 83% of being automatable, whereas occupations where people earn more than $40 have a uh, on average, a 4% probability um, of being automatable going forward. And I think that is one of the key challenges when it comes to disruptive technological change, that it has the potential of reducing inequality, um, at least in the, the short run. Um, I think the long run story, though, is overwhelmingly a positive one. You know, uh, it used to be the case that income growth, GDP growth was stagnant for a very long period of time. And it only really took off with the first industrial revolution, which allowed us to produce with, uh, more with less, which allowed us to shift into you know, air conditioned offices rather than working in coal mines and, and factories. And with jobs that entail creativity and complex social interactions being the least susceptible to automation, but also the things we enjoy the most, I think there is a very strong case to be very optimistic about the long run of the future of work and the future of the tech economy. But I do worry um, about some of the short-term disruptions and hopefully we'll get the chance to elaborate a bit more and discuss that a bit more uh, during the Q&A. Thank you very much for your attention. Great, thank you very much, Carl. Um, that was absolutely fascinating. Um, um, I'm disappointed we had so little time, I guess, to, to get into um, research you've 
done here. Before we actually, let's say, delve back into some of the deeper points there, I wanted to, to pick up a more of an economics-based question with you first, if, if you don't mind. And it's the issue of inflation. Um, and we're reading a lot about inflation at the moment. I was just wanting to get your view on, you know, is this something that is important right now? Why is it important? And indeed, can history teach us anything um, with regard to, you know, disasters of the same scale uh, that happened recently? Well, I think there are obviously many things that drive inflation, including, you know, very expansionary uh, fiscal policy and including big infrastructure projects and so on and so forth. Um, and, you know, coming out of this pandemic and, you know, uh, having uh, run very expansionary monetary policy for quite some time in combination with now quite expansionary uh, fiscal policy, uh, there is the case for, you know, uh, there being some inflationary pressures, which we already see in the data. I think the question is, is that going to be transitionary or is that going to feed into something that's more permanent? And obviously what technology does is lowering prices uh, of a lot of stuff. And, uh, and is in that sense, you know, counteracting inflation and by pushing down wages in certain domains, it's also potentially reducing uh, wage inflation. So I do think that we have some long-run deflationary pressures stemming from the trends I just described with offshoring and automation, but obviously those are sort of more long-term secular trends and, you know, in the short run, uh, fiscal and monetary policy might well put us on a different trajectory. So I think there are many var variables to look for here. Uh, but automation and offshoring are clearly two important ones. Can you elaborate a little bit more there on offshoring and what you mean by that? So for example, you know, if you see that uh, countries like Ireland and Britain and the United States increasingly offshore production to countries where uh, incomes are lower. That means that we get cheaper goods uh, in return as a consequence of that, which, you know, creates some deflationary uh, pressures. Um, and it also means that it potentially puts pressures on people's wages uh, at home as people in Ireland and Britain and the United States increasingly compete with workers um, in other uh, places. So, you know, I think it um, is something that has, you know, played a role in putting downward pressures on wages in particular uh, since the 1990s. Um, with regard to the, the approach being taken by um, the likes of the EU and the US with very large injections in public policy um, uh, projects, uh, do you think it's the right way to go? Um, have these things have been done in the past. Is it still the correct thing to do? You mean the packages that currently yeah. being put in place? Yeah, I mean, obviously, no business, no individual could have predicted this pandemic. Uh, nobody really did. In fact, you know, even with experience in China, we were waiting for you know three months uh, before reacting to what was going on um, in most of Europe. And, and clearly, you know, if you're a business, you're a bit like, you know, with a football team. We're currently, you know, all watching uh, the European Championships, right? And, you know, one reason that these uh, national teams are often not as good as the top teams in Premier League is that they don't play together as frequently, right? So you have, you know, a lot of intangible capital being built up in teams, in companies, with people who built this stuff together and created it and collaborated for months and years. And if that is being destroyed by the pandemic, and then you have to rebuild it from scratch again, you know, there's potentially a lot of intangible investments and a lot of future productivity growth in terms of small businesses uh, being wasted. Uh, there's also a risk uh, for growing market concentration, unless we, you know, support particularly uh, the smaller uh, companies. So, yeah, I think there's been a clear case for, you know, 
uh, expansionary fiscal policy and all sorts of support schemes for businesses uh, and workers who've struggled due to no fault of their own. But, you know, as important as it is, is putting these schemes, uh, schemes in place, it's also important to make sure that they are temporary uh, and not permanent. And I think, you know, if they become permanent, the inflationary concerns become more real as well. Okay, thank you very much. Um, moving back then to your book, The Technology Trap. Now, uh, I understand that in there you compare the British Industrial Revolution to the computer revolution that we've had over the last four years. And you argue that the long term benefits of both events have been immense and indisputable. Um, can you give me a little bit more detail on, on that comparison? And, and again, like the inflation question, if there's anything we have to learn from the Industrial Revolution that can be applied now with regard to our approach to So um, I think um, the key lesson from the first industrial revolution is that periods of labor replacing technological change when automation accelerates um, can be uh, rather bumpy. And, and we shouldn't make the mistake of thinking that just because productivity is growing or because the economy is growing, that that sort of inevitably trickles down to in people's pockets uh, in the short run. If you look at the output growth as the British economy took off between 1770 and 1840, it's expanded by 40%, uh, or actually almost 50%. If you look at the trajectory of real wages during the same period, it was stagnant and probably even falling at the lower end of income distribution as many middle income jobs were um, being automated away. And, and you know, Frederick Engels and Karl Marx famously wrote the Communist Manifesto uh, in response to uh, the industrialization process, right? And, and you know, with the benefits of hindsight, was clear that they were wrong about the long run trajectory, in part because wages eventually began to grow because of uh, people's ability to increasingly adjust and a wave of enabling technologies creating new jobs in new industries, but also because we developed a welfare state that took care from pe uh, of people who suffered from the force of creative uh, destruction. Uh, those are you know, key aspects that prevented the socialist revolution that they famously predicted. But they were actually fairly on target about many of the short run effects of the mechanized factory. Indeed, that was what they observed. So Frederick Engels, for example, in these conditions of the working classes in England, is fairly on target about sort of the period he's currently writing about and lives through, uh, but wrong about the future. And clearly that is something we should be concerned about today. We're living through similarly a revolution in technology, a revolution in artificial intelligence that as the first industrial revolution has the potential to create entirely new goods and services that were previously inconceivable, that has the potential um, of allowing us to produce more uh, with less, uh, but also has the potential uh, of disrupting a lot of jobs in the short run. And I think, you know, if we ask ourselves why are a lot of people unhappy, particularly in, you know, old manufacturing towns, well, it is that many of those jobs have been automated away uh, or offshored over the uh, past couple of decades. And as I mentioned in my presentation, it's the low skill, low income jobs that remain most exposed to technological change going forward. And there's a real risk that that continues to drive uh, uh, the, um, the acceleration in inequality that we've seen in recent decades even further. So to, to, to pick up on that point then about, you know, short term effects being, or the disruption being the worst aspect for a particular class of workers, also the point you made about the welfare state, is it then you believe um, something for each of the economies in the various states to step in and try to anticipate the worst of this and to ride out or to put in measures to ride out the bumpier sections of the next say, 20, 30 years that have taken automation? Well, I think it's uh, totally reasonable to have some sort of automatic stabilizers in place, which few people can fall back on and feel certain that they can fall back on during a time of crisis and not have to necessarily rely on the government in place and putting, you know, uh, some sort of a uh, compensation package uh, 
together. So yes, I do think that the welfare state has played an important role in making the force of creative destruction possible in the first place. We do actually even see that during the first industrial revolution because Britain was actually quite special in the sense that it was the only state that taxed itself and it's you know relatively well the elite two percent of gdp to provide poor relief through the poor laws and if you look at places where the poor laws were more generous you have much more less social unrest as a consequence uh, of mechanization now that is not to say that you know you can't overdo it on the welfare side of things as well and clearly you know uh, welfare states the modern welfare state in places like Sweden and in, uh, Scandinavian countries and in most of Western Europe are so much more generous than anything uh, that existed back then. I mean, prior to the Great Depression, there was no country that had a, you know, a welfare state uh, really worth uh, mentioning. Um, so um, while there is clear case for it to uh, you know, uh, smoothen the transition, there is also concerns of some adverse impacts on jobs. And we see that, for example, in certain communities that have suffered from automation, people rather than moving to where new job opportunities are being created, try to st stay rather in the communities in which they live, which sort of hampers structural transformation. Um, so yes, there is a trade off there, but I think, you know, on balance, we do need a welfare state for people also to have the positive attitudes towards technological change, which after all is required for it. Or people may say like the Luddites, we're not going to put up with this. We will opt against it. Very good point, actually, uh, for me to come in and um, on, on that point of Luddites is uh, my next question. Um, you know, the, the, the Industrial Revolution had a powerful narrative around uh, the Luddites, and today we are dealing with fairly fast paced change again in just in a slightly different area, maybe more service dominated to an extent. Do you believe we have a modern equivalent of the Luddites? And if so, could I be so cheeky as to suggest it might be regulators? Well, um, I don't think we have an equivalent in the sense that there's nobody out there that is going out and smashing machinery uh, for the fear of losing their jobs. And it's also much harder to smash uh, algorithm than a text-style machine. So there may be some physical reasons for it as well. But we do definitely see some protest over automation. So you know, in the United States recently, dock workers went on strike over the fear of the introduction of autonomous cargo trucks. Interestingly, though, when you see the exact same technology being introduced in harbors in the Netherlands and in Germany and in uh, Norway, you don't see any reports on strike. So there seems to be uh, a case to be made that you know, labor institutions and maybe ma labor management relations do to some extent matter uh, in uh, all uh, of this. And I mean, to your question, whether regulators are the ones who are the Luddites today, well, I think there is a risk of over-regulating some of these technologies and particularly artificial intelligence, uh, which is not yet the mature technology. It must be said, right? If we had, you know, tried to minimize the adverse effects with the steam engine and tried to make sure that it could definitely not have any adverse consequences whatsoever, we would probably never have had the industrial revolution. So, you know, uh, trial and error is a part of innovation and we need to, you know, uh, accept some risk in development, including some disruption to labor, uh, for it to uh, actually happen. But I think I'm not sure if you know I would describe regulators as luddites. I think it's probably you know more of a general uh, risk aversion uh, than anything else. Right, and then one final question then before we move on to the panel session. Um, do you think that we will have any lasting uh, effects of COVID on the labour market? Or is it simply um, that within a couple of years, we'll just be back to normal? And a lot of this will be 
No, I do definitely think there will be permanent effects, but I think there's more sort of an acceleration of things that would have happened otherwise, right? So the shift to e-commerce, the shift away from the high street was already ongoing, but was very much accelerated by the COVID-19 pandemic. And I do think that, you know, there is going to be a group that out there that is less likely to want to go to restaurants and less likely to want to travel and less likely to want to commute to work. And, you know, if you're Pret, for example, and you built a business around selling sandwiches and coffee to uh, commuters, then obviously that is going to have some sort of uh, permanent impact. So, uh, you know, uh, there is going to be a, a permanent shift from, you know, physical to digital in certain industries. I do think travel is going to take some time to uh, travel. Hospitality is going to need some time uh, to recover. Uh, there are other domains as well. Uh, but clearly, you know, it's not a completely new world of work, uh, but it's an acceleration of what was already ongoing.